All right. <laughs> well, I want to welcome everyone to Professor Elsa Cleland, and she's going to be presenting the potential for California wildflowers to adapt to climate change. <laughs> All right. So thanks everyone for being here. Um, I, I, you know, I'm very excited to present some of my work from my lab today. And uh, I think a lot of times when we talk about climate change, it feels really heavy. And uh, my sort of favorite thing about this project is that to me, it feels very hopeful. And so I hope that you find that too. And for anyone joining us online, I hope that your students feel that way as well. So as we go through the talk, I'm going to be focusing on this lovely little orange flower here, the California poppy. And uh, we are really using this species as a model system to try to understand the potential for plants to adapt to climate change. So I want to make sure to start with a really important acknowledgement. This is uh, Dr. Liz Ryan, shown here in the lab extracting DNA and in the field uh, in uh, the Antelope Valley National Poppy Reserve. So Liz started her research with me uh, as a dissertation, as her part of her dissertation project, and really none of this uh, research would have happened without her very hard work and dedication. Okay. So as we're all aware, it is getting warmer worldwide. And it's also getting drier in a lot of places. So this is a figure uh, from a publication that, and in places in the world where it's red or purple, those are places where it's projected to become a lot drier because of more severe droughts um, in the coming decades. And those that little black stippling that you see there is where we have really high confidence in those projections. So really in a lot of places, in the world, plants are likely to experience more water stress. And uh, I'd like to just get a sense of your understanding, um, your own intuition about what's going on. So, um, you know, as it becomes more arid, as temperatures rise, how will plants persist in the face of climate change? Um, and, and that depends a little bit on their ability to tolerate uh, the, the amount of climate change that they have. So ecologists, this is a very common thing that ecologists, ecologists often say, that in order to persist under warmer and drier conditions, species must be able to tolerate that climate change, adapt evolutionarily, or move, right? They may migrate. And one way that species can respond to climate change is by altering their phenology. So Phenology is this very specific word. It means the seasonal timing of developmental events in the lifetime of an organism. And so that could be leafing or flowering for a plant. That could be the time that eggs hatch for birds. Uh, but it's important because it determines the environmental conditions and also the biotic interactions that are experienced by individuals. So phenology tends to be highly sensitive to environmental cues, and it also tends to vary a lot among species. So just one example of seasonal phenology, which a lot of people are aware of are maple trees. You know, maple trees go completely dormant in, nor in Northern hemisphere winter. When it's really cold in the spring, their leaves um, come out. They, they, are, they have the most leaves in the summer when they're photosynthesizing a lot. And then the autumn, they turn these pretty colors and they fall off the tree. Now, if they grow those leaves too early in the spring, they might get frost damaged. And if they drop their leaves too early in the fall, they miss out on the ability to photosynthesize and gain more carbon for the plant, right? Too late and they can't absorb the carbon and nutrients that are in the leaves. So what you can see here is the ability of plants to really time their phenology to the seasons is important. And phenology is also important because shifting phenology that's been observed worldwide is one of the most um, sensitive indicators that species and ecosystems are already responding to climate change. So for instance, um, along with warming trends, we've seen that many plant species are flowering earlier in the spring. So the photograph that's here is of a lilac. And we know from observations of botanical gardens that these uh, species, these individuals are flowering earlier um, now than they were in past decades. Birds are also migrating earlier and there's an earlier green up of the land surface evidenced in uh, satellite images. Um, now these phenological shifts are important because we think that they allow species to track climate so that they're really able to be active at times when temperature and rainfall and other resources are favorable to their growth um, and survival. 
Now, if you're interested in species conservation, it's important to know whether these changes are plastic. So that's a term that we use saying that it, that's, that's a flexibility that can happen within the lifetime of an individual organism, or whether these changes are due to adaptive evolution, um, which means that these are changes that will take generations um, to occur. Now here I have to give some background. So when I was um, talking with the Heat Hub folks about giving this presentation, I said, I should assume that everyone knows how evolution works, right? And they said, no, you should not. <laughs> I said, okay, great. Um, well, uh, so, so an understanding of evolution is important to understanding the potential for plants to adapt to climate change. And a great resource for um, teaching evolution is this website that's hosted by Berkeley Understanding Evolution, and in particular, the Evolution 101 uh, module. It's really nice because it has this very modular structure, so you can just pick out, you know, particular pieces of, of topics that you want to teach about, and you can kind of just ignore all the other material that you don't really need, so it's very adaptable. Now, when you land on the, the page for um, Evolution 101, it has this very simple definition of evolution here. It's very simple, but it's very broad. It really goes from microevolution within species to the kind of evolution that happens over millions of years and generates uh, the incredible diversity of uh, biological diversity of species that we have today. But for this particular project, the important uh, background for students to understand is microevolution, this idea that is simply defined, where evolution is very simply defined as changes in the frequencies of different gene variants within a, within a population over time. So in the next couple slides, I'm just going to highlight um, a few, uh, just really, I think, three topics within understanding evolution that can be used to kind of to teach these concepts. So uh, evolution occurs when there's a change in the heritable information that is passed from one generation to the next. And so I'm going to give you two examples, and it would be useful for you or your students to look at them and ask if evolution is occurring in these examples. So in the first example on the right, you've got this population of beetles, and you can see that there are two color variants. Uh, and the population starts with about 10% of the beetles being brown and the other 90% being green. And then over time, you can see um, on the bottom there that after several generations, 70% of the beetles now have the brown gene. Now, there's another example here on the left where there's a pop this same population of beetles, um, but it experiences a drought and they become food restricted. And as a result, um, for multiple generations, they're smaller. But after the drought, once there's enough food, they return to kind of their original size. So um, talk amongst yourselves and it, is evolution occurring in either of these examples and why? Um, so, the, so this example on the right, where you have a change in the frequency of different genes in the population, that is absolutely evolution. That's, that is the definition of microevolution, right? Here on the left, what we have are what these, we would have called these quote unquote plastic changes. So these are individuals, these individuals are bigger or smaller depending on the availability of food, but that that, it, that size is not going to be passed on to the next generation, right? So the next generation will have equal opportunity to be big or small, depending on um, the food that they uh, have available. So, but part of this conversation was really interesting because what I listened to, I, he I heard people talking about different mechanisms of evolutionary change. So there are many different mechanisms of evolutionary change. So one that I think a lot of people think about is mutation, right? That there's something new that's totally new that's arriving in, in that, that has never been seen before. So that is certainly a really important mechanism of evolutionary change, but, the mut but mutations are random. They are um, most often deleterious. They most often lead to low fitness when they appear. If not, they can be neutral. They're very seldom beneficial. And so we make the assumption that the beneficial mutation rate is going to be so slow that that's not what's going to save uh, species from climate change, right? That's not going to happen realistically within the next couple of decades. So we kind of ignore it, really, in, um, when we're thinking about this. But then there's um, genetic drift. So this was this random, you know, what happened if sort of something random happened, someone stepped on the green ones and so only the, the brown ones were left, right? That's called genetic drift. And that is a mechanism of evolution because it results in a different frequency of gene variants in the next generation, right? So even though it's random, yeah. 
Uh, mutation is random, genetic drift is random. Then there's migration, right? So you have one population um, over there and one population over here. They might look different. In this case, they're brown and green, maybe because of genetic drift, right? Now, if you have individuals that move across the landscape, migrate from one place to another, that, that is a very, very important mechanism for maintaining genetic variation across the landscape. Once again, that can change the frequency of genes in the population over time. So migration is actually a mechanism of um, this kind of microevolution. And it's really only this last one, natural selection, where we're making some kind of an, we're, we're inferring that, um, in, that the traits, these heritable traits of individuals are changing over time because those traits are, are beneficial. That's really uh, where we're inferring natural selection. So there, what, there would be one more, if we want to, we can have people interact again. There would be one more opportunity here for students to interact, and especially if they've learned about this before. It'd be a great time to ask, you know, what are the requirements for evolution by natural selection? Uh, this is this is a question that you can ask anyone at any stage who has who has learned about evolution, and they can and they can answer it. All right, so we're we're talking about some famous examples here, where there was a white moth, and then over time it became brown when the environment changed, right? So there are a few things that happened in that case, right? So the first is that there was variation in traits. Right? So variation is absolutely a necessary requirement for evolution by natural selection. So you've got to have variation in traits. Those traits have to be heritable. That means they have to be passed on faithfully from one generation to the next. Right? And then you have to have differential reproduction. So you have to have some sort of selective agent where, whereby individuals with some heritable traits have more offspring than others. Right? They could have more offspring because they produce more offspring, or they can have uh, more offspring because they're the only ones that survived. But either way, there has to be sort of this variation in uh, reproduction. All right. So let's let's actually go now with that background to this question that I started with. What's the potential for plants to adapt to climate change? And I like to say that I think some of this, this potential is hiding in plain sight. And um, I say that because if you think about it, really widespread species are already experiencing different climates across their range. So if you think about the state of California, we have really remarkable climate gradients in California. So this is a figure that I think shows that nicely. The colors are showing an aridity index. And what this does is it combines temperature and rainfall into one number. And it, so it shows that, for instance, in Northern California, in these green or blue colors, it's really cool and wet. And in Southern California, where it's orange or red, it's really quite warm and dry. And so if you think about a species that's found all the way across California, you would expect that there would be genetic variation in the populations across the species range because those populations have historically experienced different climates. All right, so now let me pose a, a little bit more of a specific question. So does genetic, existing genetic variation across a species predict the potential to both tolerate and adapt to climate change? And we're gonna start with a hypothesis that the Southern populations which have experienced historically drier conditions should be better drought adapted than the Northern populations. I think this is a pretty, a pretty reasonable starting hypothesis. And so here we've been focusing on the California poppy. It has this really lovely scientific name, Aschultzia californica. And of course, it's the state flower of California. So lots of people know it. And it's known for really truly spectacular wildflower displays. I know, wow, right? So this is a photograph that was taken from a small plane over Walker Canyon, which is in Riverside County. And it was during the super bloom in 2019. This was um, posted in the California Native Plant Society Facebook group. It's not like this every year, but honestly, if you drive on the 15 north through um, up to Riverside, it's pretty orange. It's pretty amazingly orange. It really, really is spectacular. So California uh, poppy is also a fascinating species because it has this really wide geographical range. So in this 
in this figure, all those little black dots are the locations of specimens um, that are archived in the California Consortia of Herbaria. So you can see it's really found all over the state. The background color shows um, annual precipitation. So red areas are, are have low precipitation. And if you were lucky enough to go hiking in many different locations in California in the springtime, you would notice that this one species is incredibly variable across its range. So these are some photographs that Liz took when she visited some of these different locations. So Torrey Pines, which is just north of us, um, has lots of California poppy and they are very small yellow flowers and the plants only live for one year. So if you're a garden, you would say it's an annual. If you're a gardener, you would say it's an annual. And if you go north, if you go to Antelope Valley um, and some other locations up north, you'll see that the flowers are really big and they're really orange. Um, and the plants live for multiple years. So for many years, they, they're perennial. So very, very different. But of course, if you're hiking around, you don't know if this variation is due to genetic variation across the species range, or if it's due just to variation in the environment in which these plants are growing. So in 2017, Liz went to many places all over California and collected seeds to try to figure this out. Now, I want to—I always have to point out that um, we shouldn't collect seeds from public lands without a permit. And um, so we did get permits. Um, but one way that we did this is we worked with the UC uh, Natural Reserve System. This is a wonderful reserve system, 40 natural reserves across the state. Um, they have a mission of research, stewardship, and education, and that includes K-12 education. So if you would like to visit a reserve, I really encourage you to. Um, you can see the different colored dots here indicate the different U University of California campuses that administer the reserves. If you're here in San Diego, uh, we all of the information you would ever want is at nrs.ucsd.edu. If you can't go out and, uh, and visit a reserve, uh, there are ways to look at species online and a great way is to explore um, in iNaturalist. So uh, how many of you have played with iNaturalist a little bit? Okay, most people. So if you go to iNaturalist, iNaturalist.org and you click explore uh, and then click on the map, you get this really wonderful visual of all the different locations that different species have been, have been observed. And then you can search for a species in a location. So here I searched for California poppy in Torrey Pines, and you can see that these um, lovely little yellow flowers showed up. All these little green dots um, are the are California poppies at Torrey Pines State Reserve. And then I did that again um, in a different location. I searched here on the... Um, which, which one is this? This is Lake Elsinore. So that's very close to that overhead photograph that I showed you. You can see all these poppies that are collect that are shown here and you can see they're much larger and they're orange. So iNaturalist is a way to observe variation in species uh, across space. Students could use it to find their closest California poppy population, for instance. All right, so now, Let's go back to our seeds. So we have seeds that are collected from populations across this really large climate gradient. And what experiments do we do in order to try to figure out whether the variation that we've observed is heritable or is due just to variation in the environment across space? Well, the answer is that we use something that's called a common garden approach. So here you can see in this figure, there's a latitudinal gradient, there's variation in flower color along it, if you were to collect from those populations and plant the seeds in one location together, if you see that all of those different populations have different um, colors when grown together, that's very strong evidence that flower color is, is heritable, right? And varies among the populations. However, it's certainly possible that when planted together in one environment, the plants would all look alike. And then that's what that would tell you is that the variation in flower color that you see across space is simply because of the differences in the environment, but it isn't heritable. It isn't heritable variation. All right, so what did we do? We grew the seeds of California poppy in the greenhouse, a greenhouse common garden, and we grew all of the populations under both a drought treatment and a higher water treatment. And uh, this is mimicking what they would have experienced in Southern versus Northern California. And I'm just gonna note that I'm only gonna show you data from about 70% of the populations. And that's because for this study, we wanted to be able to measure reproduction. Remember that 
variation in the amount of reproduction is part of the requirement for natural selection. And some of these populations take a really long time to produce flowers. So I'm only gonna show you data for some of them today. All right. So this is a figure that shows on the vertical axis, the average number of days it took for individuals to flower for different populations. And each population is a dot here on the graph. Uh, and the environment in which we collected these populations is shown on the horizontal axis, going from very dry on the left to very wet on the right. And um, I'm, I'm wondering if we can invite the folks on Zoom to interact with one another and do kind of a think pair share, although there might be, it might be more than a pair of you. Yes, these are all the same species. Yeah, that's very, that's very critical, right? So these are all different populations of the same species. All right, well, let me tell you what, I, what, we, what we saw. So you, you know, in classroom, you would take, you would take a lot of time to share. Um, so what we saw in this figure was that the Southern populations flowered really considerably earlier than the Northern populations, right? Up to a month earlier, it's a big difference for individuals of the same species. Now, the other thing you might notice is I told you that I grew these under drought conditions and high water conditions. But I'm not at the, you, there's no signal here. I haven't shown you. There's nothing with a different color under drought or high water. And that's because there was no statistically significant response of the phenology to water availability. So um, this just averaged across those treatments. But you can, the amount of variation within these populations was very, very small. So hopefully you can see the error bars there. That's a pretty big error bar. But in some cases, the error bars are so tiny, you can barely see them. There was a lot of genetic variation across populations and very, very little, almost none, uh, almost no variation in, in phenology within populations. So that's gonna become important. So now I'm gonna add a second slide here. And in this figure, I'm showing the average total seed mass produced by plants from each of the populations. So again, here, each population is a dot but now I'm showing the average for the population when it was the, for these individuals when they were grown under high uh, soil water and under, under drought, under low soil water. And you can see a couple different things here. So first of all, hopefully you can see that this line for the under drought, this orange line is not flat. In fact, these Southern populations were more drought tolerant. They were able to grow and produce more seeds, both under drought and then they were also able to really capitalize on high water availability to produce seeds. Whereas these Northern populations were really not very drought tolerant at all. Um, and this ability to produce a lot of seeds with high rainfall makes evolutionary sense for these Southern populations because they're adapted to growing really quickly in our short winter season when it rains um, here in Southern California. So this ability to capitalize on high water availability um, is likely really important for those populations to persist uh, in the face of climate change. Now those results, along with other data that we've collected, show that Southern populations have a suite of traits that are associated with drought adaptation. So these populations in the South, they flower early, they complete their life cycle very quickly, during the time when water is plentiful, just during that time of the winter rains. To do that, they have to have very thin leaves um, so that they can grow really quickly. They don't invest very much in roots at all. They're just investing above ground in leaves. And when they produce seeds, their seeds are very small and they can be dormant in the soil for a long time. And what that allows them to do is to wait because um, you know some years in Southern California, it just doesn't rain very much. So they can wait and then germinate in a high rainfall year, producing those super blooms that we get really excited about. All right, so let's return to that question that I posed earlier. Um, does existing genetic variation across the range predict species responses to climate change? Uh, are there a potential to um, adapt to climate change? And I would say yes, and that's because we saw that, that Southern populations had many traits that were associated with drought tolerance. Uh, and so this is the really hopeful part, right? That harboring, that within this species, this species already harbors the genetic variation that it can use to adapt 
um, to continually dry our conditions. However, I think that there's some, also some really important um, conservation implications. And that's because we saw that that trait variation was across populations rather than within populations. So that means that in order to protect that adaptive capacity, you really need to protect species all across their range, all of those populations across the range. So of course, there's the national parks, which protect really big populations, but even those little natural areas and city canyons and local open, open space reserves can harbor really important genetic diversity that can help species um, adapt to climate change. Now, they also these results also highlight a really key question in that restoration practitioners are wrestling with. So given these predictions that it's going to be increasingly warmer and drier in California, if an area gets disturbed, let's say there's a fire and you decide you want to engage in restoration and you go out and you're going to plant some seeds, do you plant the seeds from the closest population that's right there? Or do you, do you collect seeds from a population that's a little further south? Where, because then you're most more likely to introduce genes that will allow that population to be adapted to future warmer and drier conditions. This is kind of an interesting tool um, that students could play with. It's called the seed, the seed lot selection tool. Um, it's a tool of the US Forest Service uh, that was created with, by Oregon State University in um, concert with the Conservation Biology Institute. And you can give it a range of temperatures and precipitations, and it will tell you where the closest seed collection source would be that would have, um, uh, that, that already experiences those uh, conditions. It's a great question um, because of course, the environment isn't just act selecting on phenology, right? Which is the only trait I really gave you, right? There are all kinds of other scenarios under which, for instance, investing in roots would be um, a, ver a very favorable strategy. So for instance, if those plants are in a very highly competitive environment, if you have a lot of invasive grasses around, it may be important to invest in roots in order to get deep soil water and to get nutrients. Um, so there are certainly going to be scenarios, and fire might be one of them, which would select for traits that are different than the ones that are associated with drought tolerance or drought adaptation. So that, I mean, that's a very, that's a very good question. And it's a very nuanced question. That's getting students to think really deeply about evolution. All right. And so um, when we move individuals around, that's called assisted gene flow. And there's this idea that that might speed up adaptation to climate change. So uh, conservation practitioners that are concerned about a population that's really isolated, doesn't have a lot of gene flow in it, um, they could potentially bring in um, some seeds from elsewhere to increase the genetic diversity, introducing those favorable alleles and speeding up this natural process of um, natural selection. However, it's also possible that that could homogenize this really amazing natural genetic variation that we already have across populations. Um, and as you know, this is apropos of the question that you just asked, those Northern populations, although they may not have the traits to be very drought adapted, may have other traits that can help this species persist if there are other stressors that arise, novel pathogens or increased fire regime, for instance. So this, is a, this ends up being a really important question that um, is the focus of ongoing work in the lab. And uh, we're, we're growing these populations and we're using Q-tips to transfer pollen between them to, to try to ask whether um, you know, this, uh, uh, this kind of assisted gene flow could help uh, northern populations adapt to climate change. And I always want to make sure to, to remind people that right now, California poppy is widespread and abundant. We're not worried about the decline in California poppy, but rather we're really using this one species as a model to help inform conservation for species that uh, face greater challenges and which you can't experiment with in this way. So I want to make sure to just gratefully acknowledge um, the funding and the collaborations and the many um, undergraduate researchers that, that have helped uh, with this and are helping with this, this research. And then there's um, definitely time for questions and some resources here in this last slide.
there are a number of really rare species in uh, in California. Uh, San Diego County, uh, uh, this was a study from a long time ago, San Diego, San Diego County harbors the greatest number of uh, threatened and endangered species of any county in the, uh, in the, in the United States. And so um, I'm, I'm going to have trouble naming these really rare species off of the top, top of my head. However, a great resource for finding them would be to go on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife website and look at the list of federally, federally endangered species, because those are the ones that, um, that we've determined are really the ones that are at risk of um, becoming extinct. And for many of them, it's because of habitat loss, um, but climate change is threat threatening that, right? Because remember I said that species have to be able to tolerate climate change, adapt or move. And so when, they're, when their range is really restricted, it's impossible for them to move across the landscape. So those would be some good ones to look at. Those are great questions. So um, they really, and so those bring up issues of migration and, and gene flow, right? So uh, when, if animals eat poppy seeds and transport them um, across space, they can't, you can have gene flow that way for sure. Um, and you can also have gene flow if you have pollinators that can travel pretty long distances between flowers. Then you could have, you know, pollinators going from one place to the other. The estimates I've seen for bees and bumblebees are on the order of, you know, they can go a, a, couple, a few miles. I can go a couple miles, um, but they're not going, you know, individual insect pollinators are, are probably not going 20 miles, for instance, to, 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 you know, gene flow at that, at that scale. So one thing that we're really curious about is how much gene flow is there among these populations? Um, and I think California poppies are a really great system for looking at that because it is so widespread. So whereas other species might have more restricted parts of their range, but we are hoping that in some of the, um, in some of our, when we're looking at some of the genome level data that we can figure out how much gene flow there is among these, among these populations. But yes, both mo birds moving seeds around or animals moving seeds around and pollinators moving pollen around should help maintain genetic diversity across populations. So that's a great, a really great point. I think that for a restoration to be successful, if you want to restore many species, you have to you have to kind of try. You got to go out there and tr and try to add them all, and then they may or may not compete with each other, and and you may or may not be successful in getting all of them there. My experience with California poppy in the South is that it it coexists pretty well with other wildflowers, and I think that's why we see it as part of these giant wildflower you know super blooms in Northern California, it tends to get kind of outcompeted um, by other by other species. And so you find it in kind of patchy distributions. So um, I, that may be an un, a, sort of a dissatisfying answer, but I think I think it depends. But if but restorations are generally more successful when you try to put more things in. So I think I think the really sort of the key thing, if you remembered one thing from my talk, is this idea that there is oftentimes more genetic variation across populations than there is within populations. And so really it's this idea that um, that protecting adaptive capacity really means protecting those populations across environments, you know, across space. So I think a lot of times people think, okay, well, we have national parks, right? Those are big, those are big parks. And those are really important for protecting populations of big things like mountain lions, right? Um, they're very, they're very important. But it's also important that can't protect the adaptive capacity for, for species because all of the genes that are necessary to adapt to, to climate change are not going to be held just in those one in those those locations. They're also held in all these little locations. So I think the reason I think that's very hopeful is that um, it means that you know if you're involved with your local state park or your local open space and you're out there, you know maintaining the trails and picking up trash and to, and reminding people not to pick the wildflowers, you're you're protecting adaptive capacity, right? So doing that very local work is actually helping species because you're protecting those, the genes um, for them there. <laughs>
Yeah. So using the, the vocabulary of genotype and phenotype, and thanks for telling me because I actually wasn't sure if that was part of the vocabulary that was used. Um, so the idea of the phenotype is what a plant is what a plant looks type. So when I was talking about traits, um, inheritable traits, I was talking about, well, I was talking about the phenotype and then the genotype is the, the genes that are, that are associated with those traits. Right. Um, so, uh, but I remember when I was talking about plastic changes, that's where you can have a change in the phenotype with no change in the genotype. So the plant looks different under one set of conditions than another, but it's not because they're, it's not because they have different genes. It's simply because the expression of those genes is different.